Hey fun fans, we're giving away a Devastator 3 keyboard and mouse combo courtesy of Cooler Master on YouTube for this month of June. All you have to do to enter is subscribe to Fun's YouTube channel and leave a comment on what you think about this year's upcoming game. You can enter once per upload and we'll pick a winner near the end of June. Peter, we talked a little bit about your team and a great Relic Recovery season. Thank you. Um, so one thing I would like to talk about is uh, trial and error and what FTC is really about because there's a bit of a luck element in that you'll get the right design um, in the long run. There's a lot of really, really great teams who spend all their effort and just don't get that critical design that that's most effective, which this year I feel like was the dump truck. And it just takes at the beginning of the season um, a lot of a lot of um, ability to like scrap everything and restart um, to drop a design. Like we started with this um, claw design originally, which was really complex and it, it seemed promising from the beginning of the year. But as we were finding, it was just too slow, and we were getting we were farther and farther along we realize look okay this may not work and it takes it takes a lot of guts to abandon that and restart midway through the year for the better design i feel like and you have to not be afraid to do that anyway um more specifically um this year we were continuing our field positioning tr system uh we call it telemetry but a lot of people corrected me it's technically odometry and it uses these small um, omni wheels on the bottom of our robot to track our position real time. And that's one of our key features of our autonomous mode because whenever it gets pushed or anything really happens, it knows exactly what's happened and how to correct for it. And we can do some really kind of cool stuff to make, make it as adaptive as possible so that no matter what kind of jams happen, um, and the competition is still trying its best, if you know what I mean. So, like, there'd be a lot of rounds where, yes, we didn't get six glyphs, but it would still keep trying to get that four, and it would know when it's jammed, when we have to try again and try for more cubes. And um, that's really what I feel like it takes to do well in FTC more than a peak score. Yes, there's a lot of teams that maybe, maybe there's if there was a team that could get eight glyphs, then... Um, once in a while, that's not as good as having that reliable four, which in FTC you need to stay alive. Yeah, um, I mean, you guys had a really awesome season, and people arguably do have a lot, or rightfully so, have a lot of questions for you. Um, oh, right, so one yeah. question we have from uh, Discord user uh, Tiny Turtle from 8581 is how much, if any, CAD do you work with before you're, you before you build your robot? Um, so this year, we're kind of undergoing a shift. We do a little bit of CAD, but we definitely don't um, CAD our entire robot. And instead, we've gone gone for ra rapid prototyping in Lego or in whatever you can we can grab to get as quickly as possible to hands-on and on the field. So that way, we can see mechanically how things work instead of spending too much time on the computer, which really doesn't it doesn't give you a lot of information on the subtleties like a, a jamming or um, all these tiny little problems that show up when you finally implement it, but not when you can. However, this year we're starting to cat a lot more, making a lot of custom parts because there is, there is a need for custom parts and it makes your life a lot easier. But for all those new teams that, out there, you do not need custom parts to do well. You can, you can get away with out of the box materials as long as you know um, when, as long as, as long as you're willing to rapidly iterate and try new designs. Absolutely. As a follow-up question for that, what is your favorite kind of building system out of the box kit of parts that you guys use? Oh, we love uh, Octobotics. They have so many holes. Steven, Steven would know more about. It. Hey, Steven, you want to come talk about Oct Octobotics? No, he doesn't. All right, that's fine. Yeah, so, I mean, we use that for our main drivetrain, but um, that was, it it's, it's doesn't really matter because on top of that, we added so many other, other things like 3D printed parts, um, a different, it really, for a lot of stuff, we really didn't care. We were just more concerned about, okay, what metal do we have lying around and get as quickly as possible 
to prototyping instead of worrying about, oh, I want to keep consistent with this uh, system. So uh, there was a really like market shift between your first year, your rookie year, and this year. So um, how did, uh, I want to ask like how did your early build st- like your early stage build process like change evolve um, based on your experiences as a rookie? Like how did you how did you um, shift the way that you thought about the game? Um, so for our first year, we kind of had to learn a big lesson the hard way, and that was you have to be fast and you have to be maneuverable, and that complex systems are not always the ones that work. We kind of bit off more than we could handle in our first year trying to do uh, this auto aim aim system with a very slow drivetrain that didn't really work in the end. We weren't really, we were debating scrapping it. And then in the, in hindsight, I feel like we should have tried for a more simple design, but we didn't. But this year we were more prepared to do that. We weren't going to have another last year in which we commit all to this design that doesn't really work. So as far as like um, the early stages go, we we definitely did um, we focused a lot on autonomous because we saw from the beginning that okay um, unlike last year this year there's a set number of points and the only way to differentiate yourself is in that autonomous mode. So we from the beginning we worked on our telemetry system of course got that more accurate three dimensions. Um, very little loss in that, so that way, once the season started, we already really had the infrastructure we needed to get started. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. Oh, go ahead. As I say, it makes a lot of sense because for those that pro- possibly don't know, um, this is probably one of this is one of the first years that I can think of where scoring was really limited. Um, most years, it's pretty like unlimited. As I say, there's always like an unlimited factor. And this year, that unlimited factor was an autonomous, which is really hard. But as we can see from this season, gluten-free really capitalized on that. And you guys had, what? I think at one point your highest was a six glyph, or did you guys have a seven or eight? No, we had six glyph. No. Six glyph, <laughs> which uh, really differentiates you. And that's, that was the unlimited factor this year, which Thank is uh, a big change from past years. Honestly, though, there is a counterpoint to that. And although we thought... That it, yes, it's technically that's the only way to differentiate yourself, as confirmed in uh, in qualifier matches. During finals, the game does change a little bit. In which I mean, apart from disconnects, I feel like you have to be you have to keep in mind if you're shooting for that for those uh, last few rounds. You the you have to keep in mind uh, defense in which the game changes. I don't think there were very very few rounds with four ciphers. And it, it almost didn't seem possible um, going into finals because I just I just feel like you have to be the one to win the race or otherwise you're dealing with the crappiest cubes. Like we, apart apart from all the stuff that happened um, in finals one, we ended up with two glyphs that were behind like some balancing stone on the other side. And that and that's just, that's because they, they won. They did, they were faster, be it because disconnects or what have you which i'm not saying we're better it's un, i'm just saying like it's unproven for that point but i feel like that that match showed that yeah you have to be the first and they were the first regardless of how and i don't know then the unlimited uh, part of it kind of changes if you know you know what i mean like definitely now 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 speed actually does matter mm. So um, just to follow up on that, so what kind of defense uh, did you guys face at Worlds or even at Super Regionals? Um, so the biggest team was Crank and Pinion, and they played they played a nasty defense against, or no, they coordinated their partner um, in one of the rounds to block us from that second crypto box. That was always the sweet spot because you could get the most bang for your buck there. Um, and it forced us to go over the balancing stone Almost every time, which was which severely slowed us down. We still did double cipher and we still did win the match, but um, it it was a lot harder and it was an effective use of their other of their uh, partner. I felt I, I thought this is how the game should be played. We should be defended here, and um, everything about that I I liked honestly. Wow, that that's that's actually super impressive. Um, 
seeing how you guys were able to adapt to that defense. I, I was watching that match, and um, I, th- I thought it was smart what Gluten Free, uh, what uh, Crack and Pinion did, but I thought it was even smarter the way that you guys were able to work around that. Um, so another question that we have is, um, I know that you said Actibotics was your preferred build system of choice, but um, do you see any uh, advantages that Tetrix holds over Actibotics? Um, I don't know. I don't think it... I, th- I We prefer Octobotics, but um, we used Tetrix our first year, and it still works. It's still metal. It's whatever... I, I feel like there's this craze to what is the optimal building system, but it's more It's more like... It's kind of like in programming where it's like, what language do you use? It doesn't matter. It matters what you do with it. So, I mean, I, I'm not the builder, so I can't... I can't... <laughs> I cannot answer those type of questions, unfortunately, but I can answer more generally, yeah, that don't don't stress out so much about what you're using. Um, if it works, it works. And metal is metal, be it Tetrix or Octobotics or what have you. As a quick follow-up question, do you feel that Lego has any advantages over Tetrix? <laughs> oh, oh, Lego is a, about 100 times stronger, I believe. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> The Lego, I mean, it's just we had it lying around. It's it's again that whatever whatever we had, but it but it's fast to build with. If you don't if you don't need metal, it's also very flexible. So for the ball, that worked out nicely, um, and we could rapidly test ideas. We originally had a lot more Lego, but we started like <laughs> slowly converting it to metal as things started to break. But it worked. It it totally like worked. And Vo- Velocity Vortex, we actually built. Um, an entire Lego shooter. We bought these like Lego metal axles. They were so <laughs> strong, but like they would rip apart their gears. But it, like it, it's it sort of worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, that, so, that's Steven. Steven did Lego League, and he like won the World Festival for. Oh, congratulations, Steven! Well, not not <laughs> champions, but like the performance. Yeah, so he's right. he's pretty much a Lego genius. So. <laughs> <laughs> So now, like uh, trans- transitioning a bit into the more technical aspects of things, like what was what was your favorite match? Like you guys have played some phenomenal matches, but if you were to choose one, uh, what would you say was had the best feel for you? Like as as uh, a driver? favorite match. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. Um. So. I, I know that's a tough question. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> there was definitely one um, where we were playing I think it was I feel like every time in finals the first round you have trying out with that alliance is definitely one of the most stressful because you just don't know if your robots truly cooperate well until they're tested and one of those one of those ones um, was in our first I forget how this one went no, um, no it wasn't this one there was one yeah, it's always stressful, but like ours didn't go too well. There was one, um, I think it was the the last round before, um, not it was the second to last round before Ford Field. So it was Division Finals one. Okay. Anyway, so um, we ciphered really really quickly, and um, I'm, I don't like you know what I'm I'm very hesitant to pick that round because Crank and Pinion's collector broke or motor broke or what have you. So that's not really that that wasn't really fair to play against them with with their um, entire mechanism dead. I, I'm as you can see, I'm like really against assuming you've won just because you played with someone and they they DC or what have you. And mm-hmm. and um, it was yeah, you can see it there. It's, it's it was really sad. Oh wait, no, that's not the round. But it was really sad to see that we weren't able to play against um, our other alliances best because I mean they worked all this all this time and they just had some random luck element uh, go wrong. So yeah. I don't know. I like the six glyph round. There was only one round we got six glyphs and it was at super regionals. The world's the world's cubes were so not squishy and they were new and they were great, but our collector was designed for squishier cubes. So we had very few six glyphs. We, I don't think we ever got six glyphs in uh, worlds, which is just to say how finicky it is. But yeah, definitely that one round where we got six in, um, in uh, Super Regionals, it looked all good from there. That was that was probably one of my favorite rounds. Yeah. Um, moving, For sure. 
uh, changing topic a little bit, what are your plans for next year? Um, are you adding team members? Are you doing anything new? Um, or is um, it just you and your brother? Yeah. So I want my sister to to take on programming. I don't think she wants to, though, so you should all, like, persuade her. But um, <laughs> but likely that's not going to happen, and um, it's probably just going to be us two again. Um, we want – I mean, obviously we're looking – it would be nice to have a drive coach, but unfortunately with the resources available, it's just so hard to include someone new who hasn't been on, and now we have to bring them up to speed. And that, and since Stephen and I are brothers, we're always meeting, and I feel like it would feel a little bit exclusive um, if someone else were to come in and, I don't know, and they're seeing all, all every week our robot like completely changes. And there, it would be hard. I guess. I guess from a programming standpoint, you could do it. So if I wanted, if if there was someone to help me, but I don't know. I think we're just gonna stick with this. I, I like the specialization because I get to do all the code, and Steven gets to do all the mechanics. And one, I feel like an advantage of that um, is that when I when there's a bug, it's very. I always have the hunch of like where it is because I've just done everything. Whereas a lot of other teams, they have a lot of people, and it's hard to find a bug where not everyone knows everything. Now, there are a whole bunch of other advantages to having more people. I'm not saying don't be the only programmer or what have you. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like it works for us, and we're a bit of an exception, not the norm for organization. And I think we're going to keep it that way. Well, huh. that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and that... that... I, I really I, I enjoyed that dynamic personally, like watching you two being drivers. Um, it's it's very fun to see. Thank you. Um, but that brings me into my next question, and that's um, uh, what do you guys do? You guys feel that there's some uh, you do you, that you have some sort of uh, disadvantage because you guys don't have a driver coach, and how do you work around the fact that you don't have a driver coach? We definitely do have a disadvantage. I mean, it's three people versus two. Um, it's more it's more power when you have a driver coach. So that's basically falls on me to do, which I'm not good at because I <laughs> cannot remember anything, as you can already see. <laughs> and um, so it, it's hard. We have to practice. We have to practice a lot. And um, it's, it's more – there's so many things you have to care about, um, on my end at least. Like at, not only am I looking at the robot, but I also got to look at the timer – I got to look at um, what cipher we're doing, what ciphers are possible, because we want to keep as many open as possible. And mm. it's it's hard. I'm not gonna lie. And I've messed up a bunch of times, um, and it costs us points. But yeah, I would definitely say that's a disadvantage. But it's just like kind of what what we have, with the resources we have. Well, that's that. I think that's a very unique insight to that because personally, like. I don't see that much of a disadvantage not having a driver coach, but I know that I'm the exception. Um, but like, it's really interesting to see how what it really affects on a drive team. So, thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. It's not it's not like it's it's a huge impact, but just it's it's nice to have a driver coach. I uh, I have one more question. Do you guys use modern robotics or Rev? Um, we use modern robotics. Um, the reason for that is because Rev was new, and any with any new system, there's always going to be pro problems. Like for example, we came from Lego League, and we were we were gonna we were uh, around during the transition from NXT to EV3, oh. and the initial year, the first year the EV3 was released, it was a train wreck. There were software errors, there were firmware errors. And well, not it. It wasn't like bad for like the majority of like little kids using it, which is why Lego released it. But for an FLL standpoint, there were problems, and we had to wait for firmware releases and updates for that to become a more robust system. And it was our instinct here. We already have MR working um, to not not transition right away because it's it's just a big risk element. And oh, and also we had a we had a bit of an exception. We were very much debating switching um, midway through the year because it was starting to look good, but we we um, we required uh, 
really, really fast update rate for our telemetry trackers, which are our odometry free spinning wheels. And we were using encoders on them that could only track uh, one rotation. So they would wrap around to zero again. And to catch that at high speeds um, with Android, which is an open operating system, it was it was very difficult. And we couldn't, with Rev, the problem is they have, a, I think they um, they might have fixed it now, so, which is why we're waiting. Um, but they, they had a blocking read on the I2C or analog ports. We were using analog. And it severely slowed down our ability to pull those trackers, resulting in wrap, what we would expect were a lot of miscaught wraparounds and in, in the end telemetry error. So yeah, we were a bit of an exception there as far as that we were like kind of hard limited to uh, Rev. Modern robotics, yeah. I mean, sorry, yeah, Modern. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have, I think, time for two more questions. Uh, one of the questions is, what encoders did you use on the free spinning wheels? Um, so we used these MA3 encoders. They were analog. And um, a lot of people ask us this, and I really don't think it matters that much. It, it really doesn't. The encoders are almost never the bottleneck. In fact, um, it's the MA3s made it extremely hard because of that wraparound bug, and you can you can get you can get away with any type of other encoder you like. I, I want to deter people from just picking MA3s because we picked MA3s. We had a, I mean, we needed we needed the ports, and we just searched, and they seemed to be the best one. But there could be a new encoder that's that surpasses them, or what have you. Um, or, or you just don't have the money for it. It doesn't doesn't really matter. The encoders don't make that much of a difference. Now the MA3s they are magnetic, so we had an issue last year with the old Tetrix encoders. We mounted them on one of our drive axles that was weight bearing, so it had all this crap get into it, um, and they're optical encoders, right? So they were starting to miss a lot of ticks, and we our telemetry system was pretty much down in worlds because because of that problem so we wanted we also wanted we were just spooked from last year where we mounted them on a weight bearing thing word of advice don't mount, mount encoders to take on weight <laughs> um, yeah it was our it was our first year a little bit rough um yeah so so yeah it doesn't it doesn't really matter we just chose these because we wanted a magnetic encoder um they were analog and don't get don't get too hung up on it and then, yeah, that makes sense. And then our last question is, what was the hardest part of the build season? Oh, the hardest part had to be one of the times there was some, there was some problems. Um, right. So at the beginning of the, not after we transitioned to, or like during our transition to um, where we were dropping our first design, we were pioneering this entire um, vision system to navigate to the, to the crypto box. We almost had it working. We had it tracking the crypto box. It could see it from almost anywhere. Um, and it could track it. We had vision for almost everything. I mean, cubes was hard, but we almost had cubes as well. And it, we found out that it was just too slow. And there was just always so many bugs with it. And the amount of complexity required was just not worth it. So, and in addition, you have to mount your phone in a way that can see the, uh, the crypto key as well as be in the right position to see everything else, which is a big constraint. Yeah, so that, so that section during the beginning, it was not, it was not necessarily looking good because it just seemed like everything was super complex and there was that whole scramble for vision. And I, I don't know, it just, I felt like our, we were putting our effort, um, too hard into vision just for the sake of vision. And then I guess and I said it was the last question. I'll do one more because I actually want right. to know this. If you're willing to answer, what is gluten free's budget, and uh, how do you guys fundraise? Um, I think that was from someone in the, uh, from Eric. Five thousand about. Um, we do practically no fundraising wow. because we are two people, and um, our parents are very very generous. Yeah, so it doesn't does definitely doesn't get us a lot of awards, but um, we um, yeah, so we do pretty much no fundraising. Did we ever do anything? I mean, we do we do a little bit of outreach, not much. 
but yeah, it's just one of those things that being two people, we just don't have the people to do. Maybe next year we could start doing it since we already have all this infrastructure, but there was always a bigger thing to do on the robot. So yeah, 5,000 for this year, which was more than last year, surprisingly, since we already had the field. We went through a lot of like um, trials of different wheels, which were very expensive. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, our final robot wasn't even that much. It's just like all the stuff that you buy during the season that you think is going to work, but then doesn't. Oh, that's yeah. so true. Yeah, like that's 90% of it, at least. The The actual robot isn't actually that much. That's true, and especially when you do the kind of iteration that you were talking about, about like actually going through yeah. robots instead of just parts, that really can add up. So. Agreed, yeah. yeah. Even so, that you guys could keep it under 5,000 for the whole season is still... Impressive that, that's to me. impressive. That's so impressive. Like, we definitely that's weren't under pretty that. low budget, really, for an FTC scale program. Yeah. So really? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That, well, that, that's very impressive. I gotta say. Thank you. Um, yeah. I guess I just never had the perspective. It's just like five thousand bucks. Like, that's a lot of money, but it feels like more than it is in FTC. Yeah. It's Always. like you spend, yeah. spend a hundred here, spend a hundred there, and you don't really yeah, notice it. And you're like, oh. Oh, we need four thirty dollars servos. No big deal. Yeah, yeah. There was there was a we used some juicy servos that were rather ear piercing. 